Hey, hello everyone, and welcome to our event today, Unmasking Facial Recognition. My name is Arik Chowdhury, and I'm the founder and director of WebRoots Democracy. I'm also the author of the reports which we are discussing today, which looks at the racial bias challenges involved with the police's use of facial recognition technology. I'm very pleased to be joined by speakers from across the world. In London, we have Gracie Bradley, who's the interim director of Liberty. In Brussels, we have Sarah Chanda, who is senior policy advisor at European Digital Rights. And later on, we'll have Natalia and Conde, CEO of AI and the People, joining us from New York. Today's event is part of the WebRoots Democracy Festival, which is marking the end of the organization after six and a half amazing years. If you're following along and wish to tweet about today's discussion, please do so using the hashtag WebRootsFest. If you're following us on Zoom or Facebook Live, please feel free to send questions throughout and we will try to put them to our panelists at the end. So a bit of background, uh, Unmasking Facial Recognition was a report which WebRoots Democracy published a few months ago. It was funded by the Joseph Rancho Reform Trust, which is an independent funder looking at uh, civil liberties and democratic reform. And a driver of this report was uh, the kind of poor quality, as I saw it, the kind of poor quality of debates on the issue of race and facial recognition technology. So facial recognition is uh, referring to um, the automatic detection of an individual's face within a crowd implemented essentially into a CCTV system and used by the police. And up until the point we were starting that report, a lot of the debates had focused around the accuracy of the technology um, with people of different uh, skin tones, rather than the, the deeper, I would say, the deeper challenges surrounding uh, racial bias and, and how the technology is actually used. So we're going to be discussing this a little bit today and also looking at examples of uh, campaigns against facial recognition, uh, looking at why it's important, and thinking about what we can do collectively in the future. I'm going to start with Gracie. So Gracie, you've at Liberty been kind of leading the charge here in the UK. Obviously, we have the Metropolitan Police have been using it, but also South Wales Police um, have started experimenting with these, these cameras. And you guys actually took it to court. Are you able to just tell us a little bit about why you did that, why you think it's, it's, it's important? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think fundamentally and from a relatively philosophical perspective but also a rights perspective when we're thinking about facial recognition live facial recognition being used in public spaces by the police we're talking about state capacity to track where you go who you go with what you're doing in real time um, and that's a real step change in state surveillance capacity um, and we're concerned about the general liberty implications of that, because we know that when people are being surveilled, when we're being surveilled, we know that we change our behaviour. So what if you decided that you didn't want the state to know that you were going to the mosque or going to a political meeting, for example, or that you were associated with a particular person? It may not even be the state you're worried about. It may be your family. Um, the point is, is that it's kind of upending our capacity to keep to keep things private and to choose what we do and don't disclose to the state and when and how. Um, we're obviously also concerned not just about the privacy implications, but the equality implications, because we know that policing um, and state surveillance technologies aren't deployed equally um, and different communities are targeted in different ways. So those are the kind of broad grounds on which we decided um, that we wanted to that we wanted to support someone um, bringing litigation. So we represented Ed Bridges, who had his face scanned, he thinks, twice um, by South Wales Police. Uh, and we think that was the first challenge, <coughs> excuse me, first legal challenge globally to facial recognition. And judgment was given by the Court of Appeal in August. So South Wales Police had been saying, look, you know, facial recognition, it's like, photographs, it's like CCTV, the court said no that's not true, it's new technology, it processes the information of lots and lots of people, the majority of whom are of no interest to the police, 
and it involves the processing of sensitive biometric data. So it's more like taking a fingerprint um, than a photograph and it involves automated processing. And the court found that there were deficiencies in the legal framework regulating the use of facial recognition and that too much is left in terms of discretion to individual police officers. The court also found that South Wales Police never tried to satisfy themselves that their software didn't have an unacceptable bias on the grounds of race or sex. And the court said, you know, we would hope that all police forces that intend to use facial rec in the future would satisfy themselves that they've done everything reasonable to make sure that their software doesn't have a racial or gender bias. So there's, there's many useful, helpful things in that judgment. I think as ever with litigation, we know that it, you know, it's not, it's not possible to have all of the political points that we would want recognized um, in the judgment. That, that's just not what tends to happen when you go to court. I think the most useful thing about the judgment is that it, you know, the, the rights infringements have been recognized by the court. Um, but additionally, the court is saying, look, the legal framework's inadequate. Now, there's a real risk in saying what we need is legal regulation when actually what we want is a ban. But I think what the court's judgment allows us to say is, look, this is a political question. Um, this is a massive question for society. This isn't something that should be decided police force by police force. Um, how is it that we've gotten to this point and Parliament hasn't had a say? So I think that's what's really useful about the judgment at the same time. And obviously when read against your report, we see that there's really quite a limited understanding um, of discrimination expressed in that judgment. So we only get to talk about what's inherent in the tech there's obviously no discussion at all about um, discrimination in deployment. Um, so that, that's the judgment. If you want to see what happens next in terms of our campaigning, um, it's called Resist Facial Recognition. You'll see it on our website. You can be a Liberty member if you want and you'll get lots of updates about it. But I think that there's a lot more to say that sits outside of the judgment, as is always the case with litigation, right? There's so much going on outside the courtroom. So I'll leave it there. Absolutely. It's super. Like you said, there are, there are a lot of useful things in there, but I guess the risk that a lot of us will have is, will the answer therefore just be regulation? rather than the ban um, that you were talking about. And, and Sarah, you're, you're doing a campaign on this at, at um, European Digital Rights around banning facial recognition. What's the story in, in the rest of Europe? Have you seen a lot of parallels here? Is there as much debate on the, on the racial bias aspects of it, or is it primarily around um, the privacy aspects? Yeah, it's a good question. Thank you for that, Arik. Um, I think that when we speak about facial recognition and race in general, like what I really liked about the report is that you did go beyond that racial bias element in the actual tech and looked at how you can put these, as Gracie says, the deployments in context, the technology in context, rather than actually just looking at the shortcomings of the technology. Um, this is exactly what Edry's new campaign um, Reclaim Your Face um, seeks to do, and I'm going to drop the I'm going to drop the links in the chat so people can have a look at it. But essentially, the main tenets of this campaign are joining with uh, a number of Edry members in various different European countries. It's really looking how you can do exactly that uh, resist facial recognition. So the same name of the of, of uh, Gracie's campaign is how can you resist it in a in a in a way that sort of understands the harms from a wide range of viewpoints. So I do think that in Europe, for the most part, we do look at facial recognition and biometric surveillance from particularly a privacy and surveillance broad lens. So how does it affect everybody? I don't think that this is a shortcoming, but it is something that we need to think about what can we supplement that argument with. So when we look at Reclaim Your Face, it's also looking at okay we want to look at human dignity how you can ensure human dignity as well as actually call for a ban on facial recognition and other biometric uh, surveillance technologies in other in, in, in all public spaces in, in in across the europe in the european union 
And this, I think, is I think the power of a mass European campaign is you can actually look at how these deployments are very like slightly different in different European countries, but essentially that they have the same risks, which are the ones that Gracie's already sort of articulated, which I won't go further into. I think what is maybe interesting for us to look at and was touched upon a little bit in the report is what are the discriminatory aspects of the deployments and how do they look in different contexts and that requires sort of like a broad analysis of what do these technologies do why were they developed in the first place um the web roots report was really one of the first that i've ever seen actually to talk about colonial heritage of biometric technologies which i think is really important when we sort of debate on these really like um, neutral terms of whether a technology is good or bad, we forget to look at the history and what they were initially developed and used for, and that was to track and to experiment and to control certain inferior populations. And this is not irrelevant to what we see today. Um, the, the power imbalance of who are gonna be subjected to these technologies are uh, very, I won't, I won't say similar, but they, they the power imbalance ex exists there still. I want, uh, re relevant to that, I think I want to give an example in France, and, it, and it's an example of the reason we need to look at these technologies in context is that in France right now, we're seeing an increased acceptance um, by various different public authorities of the need to um, use facial recognition in law enforcement, but also in other de deployments of social services like um, EIDs. And okay, so this on the on the actual technology itself, you can contest like we don't want to see more facial recognition technology used in any regard. Looking also at the broader context of what's happening now in France, you also see a broader context of sort of a crackdown on, on certain minorities, particularly Muslims in France. You see an increased sort of impunity by which instances of police brutality take place, such that you have really severe examples of certain people um, encountering violent uh, experiences with the police and very little accountability for those, ex for those, um, for those encounters. And you also see a situation where uh, the French state is looking to also further crack down on our ability to hold them accountable. So currently we're looking at a bill that's going through right now in France, which is going to um, limit the ability of people to um, share images or videos of police officers on social media. So at the same time, we, are seeing an increase in the extent to which a state will watch us, but an, a limited the extent to which we can watch them and hold them accountable. And for me, this is the broader power context that we really need to look at facial recognition. Um, in answer to your question about race and whether the conversation is really happening on that uh, scale, I would really say it's, it's not. Um, it, we want to see that and we're seeing some good examples of some organizations really looking at how far certain racialized or marginalized populations are impacted by these technologies. So Privacy International have gone, done a really good investigation recently into um, biometric um, databases and EU funded, uh, EU funding, EU aid funding actually looking into the, bio, the development of biometric databases um, and the extent to which this is being used to uh, facilitate deportations across the EU. This is a really good example of that. Um, I can share also in the chat, my colleague Petra Molnar has done a report which looks into facial recognition, but also other AI uh, deployments that are happening at the border, particularly in Greece. And these are also some examples of, I think, not just looking at the conversation, but also this broader context of power imbalance, where we see these technologies being deployed. Um, and the, the problem is not framed as just the problem of the technology is not only framed as a problem of, of surveillance or privacy, but also a context of power and the exploitation of certain vulnerabilities of, of various different uh, people and groups. And I think that's an also a really important angle we need to look at. Yeah, and the, the, the France example is one that um, we looked at a lot in the reports. So France is a country that I can't really figure out in terms of its consistency on 
on civil liberties, right? It seems quite inconsistent in my opinion, uh, depending on which group, uh, which demographic we're talking about. But it was a good example for looking at another issue that we looked at in the report, which was uh, the potential implications uh, for women who wear the face veil, the niqab, Muslim women who wear it, and what increased surveillance could mean for their freedom of religion. Um, and the thinking behind that was if you look at European countries where they've introduced face veil bans, such as uh, France, they're often framed as being about secularism, but have always been actually um, underlined by conversations on CCTV and state surveillance. And then you could infer from that with facial recognition, you could see that happen in future. And maybe we haven't seen that in the UK, but we've seen that debate definitely happen in the UK around banning the face veil. Um, I wonder whether, Gracie, perhaps you, you, you've seen any kind of similar discussions in the past around CCTV um, and the same issues we're talking about facial recognition. Like, are, there, are there parallels in the same way around people's privacy being eroded, around um, certain communities being targeted. One of the examples we included in the report was, I think it was called Project Champion, maybe in Birmingham, where they flooded an area, a Muslim area with CCTV cameras and then the community kind of revolted. Uh, do you know of, of many examples of that or, or similar conversations from 20, 30 years ago in the same area? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I have to say, I have to confess, actually, that on reading your report, I realised that I had just been fundamentally misunderstanding how CCTV works, number one. Um, didn't realise that there was the operator, all the rest of it. So that's one, one really good learning point for me. I mean, I'm... We, I've spent less time... Obviously, I've spent less time reading about CCTV um, and kind of was quite young when those debates were all happening. Um, I think what's really interesting about that dimension of the report, though, in discussion of, for example, prevent is um, in that way that Sarah's just spoken about the conversation about the technology just becomes completely extracted from its context. So it's rare enough that we hear about you know racialized police abuse of power and technology just generally like it's quite rare that you would be i would be having a conversation about facial recognition and anyone would understand why stop and search was relevant number one i think it's even rarer that i would be having that conversation and people would understand why prevent was relevant um so i think that the work that the report does in actually just setting out, look, these are the fundamental issues with prevent. This is the broader kind of securitization agenda. This is how facial recognition might fit into that logic. I think that that work is really good and really important because I think my one of my key reflections in having done this work over the last few years is just the extraordinarily low level of racial literacy um, among policymakers people making tech, specifically in the UK conversation. I mean, I'm interested to hear where it is in other parts of the world, but I've had conversations with civil servants where they've asked me, why do Western police forces have such problems with minorities? And they've asked me, they've said, I've been told before, oh, well, you know, we didn't say that that racial disproportionality, which was unexplained, is racism, because then everybody will think their local police officer is racist. Those are the conversations that I've been having to have, right? And so I think one of the where do we go from here questions for me is how do we cover that ground? Like obviously your report does an amazing job of doing that. Um, when you're in other fora where you can't just tell people read this, read that, you kind of constantly, or I'm constantly coming up against, well, that's a problem with the police. That's not a problem with facial recognition. That's, that's a problem with the state. What does this have to do with facial recognition? So I'm interested, um, and Sarah, you probably thought more about this. I'm interested in, in how we bring those challenges in the space that we have, which is obviously often just quite an, a short adversarial, um, all the conversations that I'm in can be quite short, quite adversarial, starting from a really, you know, a really low common denominator.
Absolutely. I don't know. So if you, I know you've been doing work actually on trying to bring together a lot more, um, a lot more activists on the social justice issues rather than, than previously. And you, and you started a new fellowship with the Ada Lovelace Institute, which I think is on a similar theme. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but how, I guess, how do you approach that same challenge? Because I, I, I find the same problem, right? If I'm meeting someone who doesn't know anything about tech or race, and then I'm saying, well, this camera is going to do X, Y, Z. It is quite difficult to communicate that unless they have all of that prior knowledge and understanding already. Um, do you have any advice, maybe, Sarah, on, on how you've been approaching it yourself? Yeah, I think it's a super hard question. And I wish I had a better answer than the one I'm about to give. But I think that it's... Um, it needs to happen on various levels, right? So you have the policy conversation, which you are always going to have to, it's going to have a, a level of generality that you can't, all, like in, as Gracie said, in these like very adversarial settings or in settings where you really have only a little bit of time to convey something to someone. Yeah, I, I've also been in, in conversations where I'm supposed to be talking about the extent to which technologies can, ex and can it, like perpetuate structural racism and I'll be speaking with someone that doesn't necessarily think race is a structural issue or even think that we should use it be using race as a t as a terminology and in those settings it's very um and I think even outside the UK context we have such a harder um time explaining some of these because of some more broader underlying assumptions are not there around race like we don't have a very the same common ground of like understanding like the extent of racial inequality and why it's relevant to all domains of 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 policy and life so on, a, on i think I, I'm, I'm sort of i think more and more that on in in settings like that you you do have to like concentrate on doing the basic work of explaining why the default position is racial inequality and racial inequity and structural racism and that's not an easy thing to explain in general even when someone is sort of on your side but i don't have a better answer to it than that like and sometimes the technology can almost be a little bit of a distraction in that uh, regard um it, it's really about focusing on that and then everything stems from from understanding that position and I think maybe there's a dynamic there which which it, we're seeing now, which is the growth of civil society that are dealing with like this issues of like tech and the so and and social tech and social issues in which now the conversation about like how tech impacts society is got a lot of intent attention and I might have more opportunities to talk about race and tech than I might have had to just talk about racism in general, which is a, is a shame. And it is also doing something to our landscape. Um, it's doing something to the extent to which other organizations are coming in to talk about racial justice issues than which are maybe more of a tech organizations when actually you had like a long history of racial justice organizations or poor migrant led organizations or whatever the injustices you're talking about that you might have deferred to on the broader structural issue. And I think we can learn something from that. Like if you're working in a space on privacy and surveillance or tech and the social good, there's a lot we need to defer to, to those actually like long-standing racial justice or social justice organizations that actually have that prior knowledge of how any new trend or any new technology or whatever it is, will impact and I think there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done to defer to those sorts of organizations and then I think on a like a broader level on like there's a lot of work that needs to be done to like build movements around and some of these technologies and not understand them as necessarily they are novel to some degree but not necessarily to say that this issue is about the tech itself and I think a lot of people, if you talk to you on the street or if you talk to my mum or if you talk to like, which you should talk to my mum, she has some good um, opinions about this, but like if you talk to people that do have a really strong core understanding of social injustice, um, they, I think they, they will be put off by like the like feeling that they don't, they're not qualified to talk about issues of like facial recognition or whatever it is but actually their experience of like other movements or their experiences of social injustices more generally can tell us a lot more 
than maybe someone who works on policy their <laughs> whole life and then have, know something about facial recognition, but don't know about the core tenets of social injustice that are informed that by that. And so I think there's a lot of work to do to actually say, okay, we're talking about facial recognition. Let's speak to people that are sex workers. Let's speak to um, anti-racist organizations or, or, or communities that have been affected by state surveillance their whole, in their whole existence. And let's actually be led by what they think about the conversation. And that might help us avoid a situation where we're always talking about ways to reform these technologies. We're always talking about ways to audit them. We're always talking about ways to measure their impact. We're always talking about ways to understand the disproportionate impact on, of these technologies when actually these are simply ways of talking about how we can make tech better rather than having the question of should these things exist at all? Should we deploy them? Should we use them? Is that fair? And these are the more foundational questions that I think sometimes we skip in these policy conversations about facial recognition or, or any other type of technology we might be talking about. I completely agree with you. Um, I completely agree with the, the notion that this isn't actually a tech issue, even though it's about uh, a technology, right? It is, pure, in my opinion, more about policing and, and structural racism. And then technology is part of that. Um, you know, wider story. And I guess what the report kind of talks about is if we lived in a kind of society where we wiped out structural racism, which many politicians will stand up and say that they admit exists, at least within the UK, within the policing structure, then surely logic would dictate you, you deal with that before handing more powers, no matter what that is, whether it's um, you know, a new form of technology or, or a new fine uh, or any of those sorts of things and, and yeah this auditing auditing racist technologies I don't, I don't or auditing technologies that will be used in a racist manner doesn't seem like the solution or you know applying some sort of ethics framework doesn't really seem like the solution either um and and one thing around this i'm quite keen to do is to change the narrative or at least in my, my perspective change the narrative from a kind of like libertarian right wing argument against facial recognition of which there are, there are many proponents who say, you know, we shouldn't have this technology because we don't want a big state and, you know, kind of big brothers watching you sort of thing. Um, whereas I'd like to see, because I think if you do that, then the next step is regulating those technologies in a way that you kind of on the surface, uh, deal with you know how long an image is retained by the police or like how data is handled rather than should we or shouldn't we use this technology um, but I'd quite like to see a more progressive kind of social justice focused angle to it and I noticed Gracie I think you tweeted I don't want to misquote you but I think you tweeted something like I head up liberty but I'm not a libertarian or something like something like that and I don't know whether you have a similar similar perspective because I consider you to be quite progressive yeah, no, so that, that was my bio. It was my bio till I ran out of characters. No, it was the, you know, I'm not a liberal. I'm not a liberal. It's quite, I mean, it's quite funny, actually, that conversation about libertarianism, because part of me, the way I've been thinking about it, part of me wants the left um, to reclaim some of that civil libertarian discourse, because I think everybody needs a critical analysis of the state. Um, that, so that, that's the angle that I've, I've been coming at some of this from. Um, yeah, so I think it's interesting the kind of the way that you might reframe it to think more about to think more about social justice, because I, I, I think that there is a real risk at the minute that there are some core liberties that the left doesn't think about enough. Um, I think that when we think about like, like there's quite a lot of tech utopianism, for example, if we look at the conversation around regulation of online speech, um, when we see some of the campaigns around um, sort of press regulation. Um, and actually, I think when you look at the response to the pandemic, right, which has actually, I've, I've seen a lot of left wingers endorsing pretty authoritarian measures, quite a lot of criminalization um, without thinking about the less restrictive alternatives like that seem worries me quite a lot, as does 
the kind of libertarian theme that cares a lot about freedom and not about minorities. Like I'm worried about, I worry about both. I don't, they're not the same, but I worry about both. Um, and I think that there's a risk that, that, that people don't necessarily appreciate things like mission creep. And so you get to kind of, well, if we use this thing only for a good reason, that's fine. And all the checks and balances will surely ensure that this, this thing is only used for this reason. Like, why would we say no to facial recognition to, 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 to you know, identify vulnerable people? Um, and that analysis is then sort of divorced from all of the things that we're talking about and just state abuse of power generally. Um, so I, th I think there's quite a lot of things that have to play into each other. Um, but it's interesting that, that, that that's the lens that, that you might, that you would approach it with. Um, yeah, I'm still trying to figure out like how we, yeah, the civil libertarian defense. I think the pandemic has had me thinking about it a lot and has had Liberty thinking about it a lot because the point is we do really care about minorities. We do really care about the people disproportionately affected. Also, those are the same people that are going to be disproportionately criminalized, um, which I guess is why we need we just we need non-policing solutions to social problems right that that's the fundamental point we need non-policing solutions and I guess that's where the social justice dimension of things comes in yeah and I, on, on the pandemic you know had had our report been published a couple of months later would have used all of the statistics around the fines which have disproportionately affected uh, black and brown people stop and search rocketed um, during the pandemic again evidence about how uh, you know, policing does disproportionately affect certain communities, even in 2020, even with the, you know, Stephen Lawrence report and all of the, the words and actions, we see very little progress in reality. Um, and I do agree with you on the left kind of just being absent really on the, the kind of civil liberties argument. And that's the, the spy cops bill recently, which I think is, um, you know, maybe the left in, in the UK could have been speaking up a bit louder on. But also, I think maybe yeah, if, if people on the left did take up the argument more, maybe we could hear more conversation around the sort of racial bias aspects of it as well. Um, do you see like the, the left in, in Europe, Sarah, it's a big question, but the left, the left in Europe, do you see like similar things to the left in the UK in terms of leaving the, the civil liberties argument to the right wing of politics? That is a very big question and I don't know if I'm qualified to answer it. In general, like whether you're talking about the UK or Europe, I think the left is very big, right? And this comes to the question about liberals or the left, <laughs> maybe like the, the real left, um, uh, which I think maybe went to more the core of like what um, Gracie's bio might have been about. But like, I think that you will see parts of the left that are really, hello, that you will be welcome to the convo. We're very, uh, I'm just talking about the left in general, making long, uh, broad statements. But I think in Germany, it's a really good example of like the left have been really powerful on civil liberties in a privacy and surveillance um, way. And that's a really, powerful thing when you have like debates in any type of way around surveillance around uh, debates around upload filters which are happening now debates um around facial recognition as well and, and making really good general strong arguments about the extent to which the state can process your data and under what conditions and i think that's a really powerful part of the argument that we can't miss out on um and the, yeah, in, the, in these sort of sections of the left, I think they do fall down on understanding disproportionate impact. And this is not just a, this is not just a concern of like the, the left in like any particular country, but it, it's also might be seen as like a concerted approach, like to say, okay, we need to show how these technologies impact everyone. Um, and that's seen as kind of like a more powerful argument for some people to contest um, contest the like invasive technologies to show that they impact everyone rather than the argument to show that they impact a certain sect of our society more or target people more. Um, and I, I think that's just a major flaw in this argument is that you, 
you shouldn't have to choose one like you should be able to make both arguments and both are more powerful when they complement each other but but just in general i think like one thing that the left in or, or anyone who is looking at these issues can look to more that hasn't really been exercised is some of the things un, under sitting abolitionist thinking which i know has been like explored a lot more in the US context. So I'd really be interested in Mitali and what you think about that is that we have talked a little bit about bans, but the conversation around abolition with respect to these things is much more than just bans. It's also about like thinking more about like a more structural response to the social problems that we're saying that we're deploying technology to fix when actually there should be a whole conversation about um, changing our resourcing strategies, shifting resources to actually deal with those social issues rather than putting them into the hands of private company, companies, which are saying that they're going to solve various social issues through the development of various types of technology, when actually what we're seeing is that make, it is actually just another way of privatizing really serious like social services in the hands of companies that we're much less easy to, uh, much less easier to like, understand control and also have input on and i think that like abolitionist thinking really looks us at us to sort of challenge these punitive systems and actually say can we shift the deep discourse shift the thinking to ways of having more social outcomes and instead of investing in all these in invasive technologies absolutely um just going to bring in um Mitali, if you're if you're watching it in yeah, I guess you can't see her coming in yet, but she's just joined the call uh, from New York. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, the conversation so far, we've kind of been looking at uh, the general discussion around racial bias and facial recognition technology beyond accuracy, thinking about how to change a narrative um, to kind of prioritize the, the social justice angle of it, prioritize the cause for a ban over regulation and also just looking at what's happening in Europe and, and in London. But in the US, um, I think we've seen the, the kind of greatest progress really on this. So after the BLM, uh, you know, after the death of George Floyd and the, the renewed BLM protest, we saw almost immediately, you know, major companies, uh, IBM and others, say we're going to introduce a, uh, a ban uh, on facial recognition technology. And we haven't really seen that response uh, Definitely not in Europe that I've, I've seen. Are you able to just talk a little bit about that? You know what the context is in the US. Yeah, the sure. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm late, everybody. There was a fire drill in my apartment, and we all had to stand outside in mass socially distanced for three hours. Different Zoom. Um, but I'm I'm here, so thank you for that. Yeah, sure. So in terms of uh, in terms of my own work, I really come to this discussion as a policy person, and I'm somebody that certainly thinks that policy is the delivery system for ideology. And in the making of uh, biometric systems, facial recognition, stingray recognition, gate recognition, any recognition um, in which human beings are, are being the are being the subject in the US context that's always in the context of security we are going to make your house safer we are going to be able to police in a way that is uh, more uh, more accurate we are going to this idea that white people need to be safe and the people that they are safe from are black and other negatively racialized people in this context and i think probably what happened um i had been part of it i had been part of a team that introduced um the proposal for moratorium actually on facial recognition in 2019 to the u.s house of representatives and as we did the communication and the education work for that policy advocacy we found two things that were really, really worrying and, and would have put us in a similar situation, certainly to the UK, and I'm not so familiar with the European context, but there was a lack of understanding from policymakers. So even getting to a moratorium was 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 really just based in trust that my myself and my team had with members of the Congressional Black Caucus. So that was number one. In Parliament, I'm seeing amazing black women who are who are standing up 
for uh, racial justice in the United Kingdom, but I'm also seeing in Parliament Black women who are standing up and saying that critical race theory is, is nonsense, right? So in the British context, you definitely have um, Black people who are in political office who are not pursuing racial justice agendas in a much higher proportion than you do in the American co context. So that's one thing that I think really enabled that. And number two, we have healthy movements. And so I think the death of George Floyd and Black Lives Matter was really just this resurgence, right? We had been protesting on um, issues to, to rein in the police since 2014 through the death of Trayvon Martin and continue to do so, but specifically using a different type of technology, recommendation algorithms and social media to keep that alive. And I think the reason that the reason that that helped those of us that had been looking at biometrics in, in, in such an amazing way and really accelerated us towards a ban. And now all my work is completely featured on a ban of facial recognition, not just in the United States, but I'm going to be working on a campaign for a global ban because we, we don't think that it's good anywhere. Um, and you might, if you're going to go big, you know, I'm always one of these people, go big or go home, just like this should not be anywhere. But what really helped us was the way George Floyd died. So it wasn't just on the knee, uh, at the knee of the police, the man looked directly into it and did it anyway. And I think at that point, people were like, hell no, we've been in our houses for nine months, black people are dying disproportionately, we're going to get all the things that we want. And so the appetite for revolutionary thinking, the appetite for an imaginary where policing means safety, and we really try to interrogate whether mass surveillance can bring us safety or whether safety lies in beloved community. And what I mean by that is the Black Lives protest that we had in the United States are thought to be the largest social movement in US history. There was, uh, the, the, there was some work done by the New York Times that said, on June 6, uh, 500,000 people from 50 unique locations updated social media to say that they were in a Black Lives Matter protest. And then 62% of those same people, 62%, so Black Americans are only 13% of the population. There was a world of white people out there who were saying, no, Black Lives Matter and we need to change the police. And then just before our last election, which I actually think is probably still going on because we don't have a concession. So, you know, the land of many presidents, white people are still with us. 45% are saying uh, that Black Lives Matter, but not only that Black Lives Matter, but going to this idea of abolition. Our social services have failed us in COVID. So there is a deeper interrogation about every single system, how we spend our money and where, where that should go. And that's a gorgeous, beautiful, amazing place for me to come in because I left the United Kingdom because I couldn't do racial justice work. It's not funded. There were no specific jobs in 2005 when I left where I could have advanced this work. Black women, specifically in the workplace, uh, the, I, I'm a journalist by training. I'd been at the BBC. I had been pitching uh, documentaries about reparations and, and why we need them and Lloyds of London and, and Bristol and the statues in 2000. And everybody was like, that's completely ridiculous. We have no racism here. And it, I just found it completely, um, it was a real death. And so I, I, I think in kind of closing, the reason we're at this moment is somebody like me was so unusual in the British context, but I joined a field in the American context. So I joined almost 20 years of scholarship on race and technology. I joined uh, movements, social movements, and, black, and the movement for Black Lives isn't as deeply integrated into tech accountability work as Mi Gente, which is a, a, a largely Latinx, including Afro-Latinx movement, Color of Change, who had been doing similar work for 15 years. And so there was already, the, the ground I feel had already been softened, but I do look with great hope at the statues coming down in Bristol. I do look with great hope with I, I, Ida Lovelace, 
you know, wanting to fund it. I mean, it wasn't going to, the funds weren't going to make anybody rich, but the fact is the funds were there, right? Like wanting to fund this type of work. And I do, um, and you and I had, had spoken about the fact that we need to find some way to collaborate because if we look at the way, if we look at this question of security and question of who is secure and who is not secure um, in white society, it directly translates to London because it's the same people that are targeted in London that are targeted in New York, right? It's the same people that are targeted in Berlin that are targeted in New York, targeted in the West Bank that are targeted in New York. And this is where, um, why I'm so enthusiastic that, that a ban is something that not just one country um, or one territory should pursue, but all. Absolutely. And this is, this is kind of it, I think. So like, if in the UK anyway, I could probably count on one hand how many black and brown socially aware tech people there are in this field, if that, right? and half of them are probably on this call, right? And, uh, and in the UK, in the UK, post George Floyd, we had a lot of like, you know, people were posting their black squares on Instagram, you know, doing them doing the odd tweet of solidarity, taking the knee, you know, putting adverts in newspapers. But we didn't see any kind of conversation around abolition um, as we did in the US. And when we did see it in the UK, it was kind of ridiculed by the press and even, you know, people on the left uh, because of the wording of the slogan, which was defund the police, right? But the, the actual debate around abolition, you know, hasn't really happened here. And I think around facial recognition specifically, we're kind of seeing maybe in, at least in my own echo chamber and our, our echo chambers a movement towards abolition, like all of us are aligned on the call for a ban rather than any kind yeah. of regulated facial recognition. I mean, I, you can imagine that I was probably one of the characters that was ridiculed around defunding the police, but my question was always like, why is white, white supremacy has no imagination whatsoever? Because why can't you think of a world beyond what we have, right? Nobody is saying do not have police. We are, we are talking about a radical redistribution of resources that lead to security. If people have food, they are mo less likely to steal to get food. If people feel safe and secure in community, then watching them using an eye in the sky shouldn't even be a value that we're pursuing. And even as we're moving forward in this work, we've rebranded. We're talking about that reimagination. We're talking um, about that rebirth. And even as we get a new group of people, um, we, we've just had elections, we, uh, you know, allegedly are going to get new people. Like I said, I, I, this is not the country to watch. Um, but we have to push them too. These are not abolitionist thinkers. These are not people that are on the left. They're just not fascists. So there's so much work to be done there too. Yeah. Do, do you think, so before, the, before this meeting started, me and Grace were actually mentioning abolition as a possible target, future target for liberty. Do you think we could see a kind of abolitionist movement around, you know, su surveillance tech or that kind of like surveillance state generally in the UK? I think you have to marry it to something bigger than just surveillance tech. Uh, the reason IBM and Amazon and Microsoft wrote those letters, which were, you know, there were nice gestures, but you're not going to sell in any country or just this one for six months. Like, that's not what we want, right? But once it was linked to wider questions of how police interact with Black people, and we were forced to watch and rewatch the death of somebody at the moment of transition screaming for their mother, it became everybody's problem to the point um, that was made by Sarah as I was coming in, you know, that when, when we were doing policy advocacy, the way that I even got to introduce the bill was that I framed, I, I framed these issues as national security issues. And I framed racism, specifically anti-Black racism as a national security issue, and then was able to make the case. Um, but it was the, the outcry, in my opinion, of white people. I think potentially in the United Kingdom, if you could get white people of good conscience and other power holders to see themselves living 
in a society where some people are not over police, that definitely helps. I just think some of the horrible conversations I'm seeing around critical race theory um, in the US context means that you're going to be fighting against other people of color. And that's a very tricky place to be in because in the, U in the US context, those people don't tend to get air. Um, I'm going to bring Gracie in in a sec, but before I do, I just want to remind uh, attendees to submit questions using the Q&A function. We have about 10 minutes left be good to get some uh, questions into our panelists. But, um, but Gracie, on, on that question of abolition, uh, any thoughts from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, the first thing I wanted to say is just that, that before we even get to kind of abolition, conversations about abolition in the UK, I think we have to acknowledge that a lot of the response to BLM from institutions, like, we didn't even get policy response, right? Um, Liberal Democrats did a good policy response. Uh, Ed Davey brought a private member's bill saying, you know, I would repeal suspicion of stop and search. Like that was a policy response that I remember. I don't remember changes in the policy platform of the Labour Party and certainly not in the Conservative Party either. So I think before we even get to abolition, like the, we, the, the issue in terms of that kind of structural lack of literacy that we talked about before, is that people were people? I don't think people even necessarily connect very well, like George Floyd's murder, with certain you know policing practices and structures in the UK. I don't. I'm not even sure that they're connected in people's heads. But when it comes to abolition, I mean, so Liberty is a super democratic organisation. We have over ten thousand members, and our members decide our policy at AGMs, and our members are elected to the policy council. So it's something that's really up to the membership, kind of. What, what they want to take on in, in respect of that question of, of abolition. I mean, I also think that there's quite an interesting pure human rights lens on these things, right? In terms of less restrictive options, in terms of the proportionality analysis, um, and actually just in terms, of, in terms of effectiveness. So like, yes, you know, if we're going to interfere with privacy rights, you know, it's got to be prescribed by law, which we can get to. Then we have to get to effectiveness. And I think there's a real question mark about the effectiveness of a lot of surveillance measures. Like when you look at a lot of the scientific literature on things like body worn video, the literature is telling us the impact is marginal at best. Um, so I think we have an effectiveness question on a pure human rights analysis, but then we get to, okay, let's say it worked. Are there any, are there less restrictive options? And I feel like that's the bit where the imagination comes in and you can come at it from an abolitionist perspective. You can come at it from a pure human rights analysis, but what are the less restrictive options? Have we considered any of them? And I think what I see so often in those slightly more adversarial contexts at the minute is just what you get is, it's either facial recognition or all the terrorists win ever. Like that's literally where we are. Um, that, that there's there's no middle ground. There's no less restrictive option. There's no, that I mean the availability of even other policing options is not spoken about in that conversation, right? Before you even get to okay, what are non-policing options? So I think there are many ways that you can come at this conversation. Um, and I'm I think that the Black Lives Matter movement has really thrown down a good and solid challenge to to human rights organisations. You know whether or not they want to become abolitionist organisations. Just, just from a civil liberties, human rights perspective, I think that's a real challenge for us there that we need to honor. And I think part of what Liberty wants to do is to try and look at some of those broad and imaginative policy recommendations that have come out of grassroots groups, of which there are actually quite a lot in the UK in terms of recommendations, especially young people. If you look at things like the IC Free campaign around stop and search, there's lots of that stuff out there and I think it's our responsibility as a human rights organisation to look at some of those proposals and say, well, actually, hang on a minute, aren't these less, restri aren't these less restrictive options? Policymakers, have you considered that? Um, because all we've seen is photo ops, right? I think that's our role in this conversation. Yeah, and I had a conversation with um, Dr. Adam Elliott Cooper for the report, who's writing a lot about policing um, during uh, the British Empire how effective people of colour then and one thing he said was just to say again the same thing effectiveness is the best in his view best argument against it and just say you know this stuff doesn't make us safer so we have cctv but we still have rising levels of knife crime for example uh, and therefore has cctv made you safer or the cctv you know has it 
uh, you know, court your, uh, I don't know, burglars or whatever, right? And kind of make that kind of argument. I'm going to bring in a question here from uh, Michael. Um, so what is the convincing argument against the technological eventualists? How do we resist the tide? The police are quite ardent that we have to use facial recognition. That impetus is reflected by what Chris Dick, the uh, Metropolitan Police Commissioner, said, in an age of Twitter and Instagram and Facebook, concern about my image and that of my fellow law-abiding citizens passing through facial recognition and not being stored feels much, much smaller than my and the public's vital expectation to be kept safe from a knife through the chest. I want to put that to Sarah. I mean, that, that's a, yeah, that is the argument that the police have been putting forward and, and that, you know, many people in who are either support facial recognition or don't really care about it and will just say, well, people are uploading their, their pictures anyway. Why, why should we care about whether they're giving it on, you know, on a police facial recognition camera? Yeah, I think it's an argument that comes up a lot and it's not just in the context of policing, it's, yeah, terrorism uses, it's also in the in the context of migration well like we also haven't talked so much about like the mass sort of biometric databases that are existing and then also at the eu level some really worrying things happening with the sort of proposals to extend many mass uh, databases from what were previously like other data to things like facial recognition um, and also to extend those databases to things such as like from like like in scope. So whereas previously they were for things like migration or law enforcement databases were about uh, serious crimes, you now see the extension of them to to um, to to petty crimes or uh, or other things that are not actually crimes. Um, so I, I, in all of those regards, I really follow what Gracie said about actually saying, okay, well, first of all, are these things effective? What are they just pure human rights analyses of, of these responses? And actually most of the things, to be honest, fall down on all of those arguments. And we, and we definitely 100% shouldn't skip the step, which is, I guess, most of our jobs, if you work in policy, if you work in human rights, that's your jobs to make that very clear. The issue is, I think, and then that goes to the core of the question, is that it's the politics often behind all of this that drives much of it through. It's the, Mutale's point about security, it's these bold, unsubstantiated assumptions that these things will, number one, either happen anyway, or that they will help us with security in some way, national security, what, whatever sort of broad, um, whatever sort of broad, um, sort of uh, justification is given. And I think this is something that maybe we should highlight a little bit more in terms of like, when we look at the ability of our existing legal frameworks to help us in some of these regards is that when you give such a broad level of discretion to the state to understand, okay, what is necessary and what is proportionate? And then so you can just give, you can just invoke a national security um, uh, justification and then for, for many for many in many legal frameworks this is considered enough then I think then you need to also think about okay so what broader techniques beyond the regular use of existing institutions can we look to then I think you need to get a lot more imaginative and also be ready to be more radical in your demands about what you're also asking for this is I think like sort of where we're at to with the reclaim your face uh, campaign is that okay so we know that under most legal frameworks, these things are not legal, right? The uh, use of facial recognition in the ways that they have been in most of the cases across Europe, they're not legal by human rights standards. And yet still we see them deployed um, because there's a wide range of discretion by which um, public authorities can deploy these systems. So then you sort of get to a stage where the tech eventualists or whatever the phrase was called are kind of to some extent we let them be right if you don't form a sort of like consistent movement to say no these things aren't inevitable and actually you have to make a framing which makes people feel powerful which shows that they are agents and that they actually feel empowered to have an ability to stop these things but if it's like you're well resourced human rights institutions or like social good institutions that aren't ready to make those radical demands, 
then we have a problem because I think like we shouldn't underestimate the disempowering effect um, you might have by just saying these things are inevitable or these things can be good and can be bad and it's kind of like a neutral thing and we need to just have a balanced argument because that I think is also quite disempowering. It can also be quite confusing for people that bear the brunt of these things actually when they only bear the, the shitty side of all of this um why is it that these human rights institutions or these tech for social good institutions are not ready to say actually no we should ban this and no we should take a radical stance absolutely i'm going to bring in uh, one final question from khadija and then maybe get uh, final thoughts from Natalia and gracie before closing because we're going to run over slightly and it's quite an optimistic question right so I mean, you know, I, I consider myself to also be a, a techno optimist, but you know, obviously recognize a lot of the challenges with uh, technology. Uh, Khadija's question is really topical. So after it was found that the Muslim Pro app, then if you're aware of the story, more than 90 million, which has more than 90 million downloads from Muslims worldwide, uh, was selling location data to the US military. The biggest call to action was to delete the app, despite uh, Facebook and other tech giants owning and selling far more data on us and with less transparency. How can we use these apps or technology as a vessel for activism as well as call for the abolition of their surveillance? So I guess it's about a twist on that. You know, are there positive ways we can be using technology um, as well as just thinking about ways we can kind of abolish all, all the, the negative aspects of it and maybe even around organizing on, on this particular issue? So maybe start with Matali and then and then Gracie and then I'll I'll close the event. I'm sorry, I clicked the wrong thing. Um, I mean, we we've seen how hashtag activism works, so I think we can definitely use hashtags to create communities online, um, to gather people, to uh, collect. Uh, signatures and then I would recommend that we look to our colleagues and our comrades in Hong Kong and get offline. I do not think online spaces are secure, uh, secure organizing spaces unless they're encrypted. Uh, Gracie? Yeah, I mean, I'd absolutely agree. Um, I, I want people to be looking at things like Signal and Rise Up and yeah, I mean, but also not just, yeah, not just because of the security, but because when you actually look at organi organizing and the history of how social change has happened, yeah, okay, the internet's new and like new things will happen because of it, but also like there are things that are tried and tested that have worked that do not involve the internet. So, I mean, I've learned loads from social media. Like I've learned loads of things about tech. I have found lots of new people, but ultimately like that is not the work of changing what we want to change that happens somewhere else. And I just think that when you think about how relational so much of that work is or how so much of that work depends on strong relationships and holding one another to account and trust, it's really difficult to do those things online, right? We, we often sometimes need other kinds of connection. And I think though that what we need, what's really crucial or what I've been struck by is a lot of people talking about how the pandemic has made lots of things so much more accessible for them when they've been told previously, like these adjustments aren't possible at all. And I think that's something like we definitely should be listening to in activism and activist spaces. Um, like, yes, it can't all happen online, but also those spaces can be really quite exclusive. So those are the things we need to think about. 100%. I, 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 uh, from a personal perspective, you know, even all of you guys, I've never actually met any of you in real life, which I find crazy. So I feel like I know you all quite well. Um, so in that respect, I think it's been quite positive for um, activism and organising. I really, so I'm going to have to close the session now because I just say right now, but I feel like this conversation could uh, go on for a long time. Khadija has said, this has been one of the most fascinating webinars I've joined this year. That's a big, that's a big, uh, big compliment. Um, but thank you all so much for joining the conversation. Thank you to everyone who's been attending. And yeah, let's keep, let's keep up the good fight. And I'm sure we'll carry on this discussion later on.